Welcome to the first session of the 2020 Smithsonian Food History Weekend, Food Futures, Striving for Justice. I'm Paula Johnson, Curator of Food History at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History, and I'm pleased to be here with Eric Spivey, Chair of the Julia Child Foundation for Gastronomy and the Culinary Arts, to launch this important discussion on World Food Day. This panel is a collaboration between two, our two organizations, as well as Food Tank and the United Nations Food and Agriculture Program in North America. Eric, we're in good company. Thanks, Paula, and happy World Food Day, everyone. I'm honored to introduce the panel's moderator, Danielle Nirenberg, the president and co-founder of Food Tank. Danielle is also the 2020 recipient of the Julia Child Award, which recognizes individuals that continue to have a profound impact on the way America cooks, eats, and drinks. Danny has been an unwavering champion for underrepresented voices in the food system with a goal of improving food justice for all. The digital floor is yours. It's now my pleasure to introduce Simlendra Sharan, the director of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations North America. I'm so proud that Food Tank has been a longtime collaborator with the FAO. Their commitment to a more sustainable food system is really more important than ever before. Vinlander, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Danny, always a pleasure. So today is World Food Day, which is celebrated every October 16th to commemorate the founding of FAO. And, and I know it feels uh, strange to use the word celebrate this year, but I think uh, transforming the food system, as I said, is really more important than ever before because of the pandemic, for sure, but also because of, of the growing climate crisis. And I'm wondering if you can explain a little bit about the founding of FAO and why its existence is really so important for us today. Yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating history, actually, and it takes us back to pre-World War II days. Uh, this is October of 1942 when uh, Frank Dougal, he wrote a, a memorandum or a document of sorts uh, uh, titled Freedom from Want of Food. Mm -hmm. And uh, this document uh, caught the attention of uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, the first lady, uh, President Franklin Roosevelt's wife. And she thought that the document made ample sense and should reach the president and uh, she invited uh, Frank Dougal for a dinner at the White House where he was introduced to the president and uh, Frank Dougal presented his ideas and also told uh, the president that with the war coming to an end, you know, you needed some issues around which the nations could come together and collaborate. Mm -hmm. President Roosevelt, uh, you know, didn't give any indication as to what he was thinking, but a couple of uh, months later, uh, Frank Dougal heard that President Roosevelt had invited 43 countries to Hot Springs, uh, Virginia, from 18th of May to 3rd June uh, to discuss uh, uh, food and agriculture issues. And that is where the idea of a permanent body was born. And uh, this translated into FAO coming into being and the first uh, uh, formal session of FAO being held in uh, Quebec City, uh, Canada, in 1945. Great. And that's the start of FAO. And FAO had its headquarters in, actually in, in Washington, D.C. till 51, and then shifted to uh, Rome. So as you can understand, the founding of FAO actually is in the wake of World War II, and it's very easy to imagine what the food and agriculture situation must have been in the world at that time. Sadly, as we, uh, okay, not celebrate, but commemorate and remember our, our anniversary, 75th anniversary, 
uh, we are in the wake of a global pandemic and the situation is really uh, alarming. And uh, therefore, it is important for us to really pause, reflect, and That's understand right. the crossroads at which we are today and where to go from here. Absolutely. We're definitely at a crossroads. And I'm wondering what you hope for, that we learn from this time in history. I mean, we've seen so much going on with, you know, rising rates of food insecurity, um, disruptions in supply chains, you know, farmers not being able to get out into the fields, or if they can get out into the fields, they're not able to sell their, their crops. What do you hope we learn from, from this particular time? This pandemic actually, you know, it's served as an X-ray for us. It has really shown the cracks where they were. But more than the X-ray, apart from showing the cracks, it has also then gone on to really widen the uh, cracks further. And therefore, the need to reinvent the system, the need to transform the system. Uh, as you rightly said, much needs to be done. We have, it, it won't be fair for us to say that we have achieved nothing over the last seven decades. That's, that's not right. The world has really moved on and we have worked uh, fantastic in field of, uh, you know, achieved some fantastic uh, milestones in field of agriculture and food production. But that all has come at a cost and the cost mostly is in terms of uh, sustainability. The cost is in terms of transparency. The cost is in terms of inequity. And that, in turn, has translated into our inability to really wipe out uh, hunger from the face of this earth. Uh, even today, 700 odd million people uh, suffer from hunger, and this figure is rising. Uh, it's, it's gone up since 2014, and uh, every year we find more and more people getting added to the ranks. And the pandemic is likely to push another 100 odd million, depending on the model you use, from 80 million sure. to about 140 million into, into this group of people who are hungry. So it's, it's going to be a big challenge. But the good part is that it has given us an opportunity to really transform and to reorient ourselves into developing a system which is fair, which is equitable, which is sustainable, which is transparent, and which really gives weightage not just to calories but to nutrition. So all Absolutely. in all, tough days, but I would be optimistic. I would take it as a, not as a stressful event, but I would take it as a challenge and try and work on it, try and reorient ourselves towards performing better. Absolutely, it is certainly a challenge and I love that you use the, the term transparency, because I think what COVID has done, as you said, exposed so many cracks, but allowed us a more sort of, you know, visible view of what's really happening behind our food and, and understanding the people behind our food and, and really being able to put a human face to farmers and farm workers and, you know, uh, those who are on the front lines of the food system every day. What are our FAO's priorities over the next few months to really make sure that that transparency is there, that the sustainability is there, that that equity is there in the food system? We have been working with national governments and we have actually really pointed it out to them that this pandemic has to be understood not just in terms of shortages. We have to really look at the cause of rising food insecurity because of the global pandemic, which is there. It's not that food is not there. Production has been good. The stocks are high. And that is seen at the global level. If you see the price, food prices, they have held. They haven't shot through the roof like it happened in, say, 2007, 8, 9. So prices have held. Production is there. Stock is there. But yet people are not getting uh, food. The reason being the question of access. And that is where this whole thing of inequity is coming into play. Uh, the economic recession which has set in has actually pushed people into, into poverty. And that has uh, in, impacted their purchasing power. So even with food available, we find that people are not able to access food. Those who are in a position to access are not accessing nutritious food, which we all know that nutritious food is costlier than 
healthy food is costlier than, say, just cereals. So if I was giving my child half a liter of milk a day, I have reduced it to quarter. If I was giving quarter, I have reduced it to zero. So I may be getting the cereal, but I'm not getting nutrition. And that is a matter of grave concern. And we have been uh, trying to work with the governments to bring this to their uh, understanding and evolve a policy whereby governments take action to ensure that everyone, especially the marginalized, have that bare minimum in their hand to meet their food requirements. Besides this, from even before the pandemic, we have been working on issues around climate change, around sustainability, around uh, proper use of resources, and trying to work with all stakeholders in this area, trying to understand the trade-offs. So the moment you have a good policy coming in, doesn't mean that there's only positives associated. There are always trade-offs with any policy. You want to increase production, you're going to use more resources. How much more will you use? In what fashion will you use? So these trade-offs are going to come into play. And we have to understand what these trade-offs are. We have to understand where to strike a balance. That said, Absolutely. I just want to underline that there's a cause for concern, but not a cause for despondency. I think we don't have to be despondent. There is enough in the world to feed the population today and in years to come. We need some course correction, we need some policy corrections. And I think governments uh, are working on it and hopefully going forward with the food summit, which comes into uh, play in 2021, uh, I hope uh, uh, some transformational changes can be seen uh, thereafter. Sure, and I mean, I think one of the, the things that was happening before COVID is that many governments in many countries were focusing on that quality shift, not just quantity and calories. You know, there, there's been a time that we've been really focused on, on filling people up rather than nourishing them. And, and again, pre-COVID, I think that was becoming more and more of a priority for many governments. And you mentioned the UN Food Systems Summit, which will take place next year in 2021. I want to talk a little bit, you know, we use the word transformation of, of food and agriculture systems. What does that truly mean for you and for FAO? For us at FAO, we feel that the system has to transform itself and address not just the farmer, but the whole value chain. And that's why it's a food system summit from farm to fork. So the whole value chain needs to be addressed. Now, what are the issues which we need to work on. I would say access would be first. Sustainable production systems would be second. Uh, equitable livelihoods would be third. Uh, nature positive production uh, methodologies would be uh, fourth. Uh, resilience in face of uh, uh, increased man-made and natural disasters uh, would be fifth. So there are these issues which are cutting across the whole food system and which we need to really address to ensure that every person gets the minimum nutritional uh, input so that he or she can lead a healthy and normal life. Uh, it is a shame that uh, more than 150 million uh, children should be, or 45 million children should be stunted and wasted in the world where uh, you know 40% of food is, is going waste. Uh, Across the, across the globe. So I think uh, we do need to transform our systems, uh, uh, the whole food system to enable the marginalized, the weak, uh, the uh, poor have access to good, nutritious, adequate food on a regular basis. And, and I'm so glad you brought up that point about food waste. I think that may be another silver lining of COVID as well, this understanding of how much food that we're wasting across the globe and, and ways to solve it. And I, and I think the UN uh, Food System Summit really gives us an opportunity to, as you said, course correct, to really look at these, these um, changes that are needed in a systemic and holistic way and really work towards a more equitable accessible and affordable food system for all that protects both people and the planet. I couldn't agree more. And there is a ethical argument, a moral argument, a practical argument, a financial argument, a policy-based argument. It's a low-hanging fruit. You have to work on ensuring reduction in food loss and waste. And you have to 
tailor your policies accordingly. What do you want to achieve out of reduction in food loss of waste? Uh, do you want to impact uh, climate change? Do you want to impact uh, resources, conserve resources? So you have to work your policies around what your uh, major uh, goal is and ensure that the energy, the resource in land and water and seed and fertilizer, which is going waste, food which is being produced and not being consumed, that is reduced to the bare minimum. I, I will not go on to say that it becomes zero because even to keep the whole food system running properly, there will be an iota of waste somewhere or the other, and that, that, that needs to be factored in. But there is no reason why we should be wasting one third of our food. And as I said, no argument, moral, ethical, practical, financial, political, can justify it. Absolutely. It's one of those issues we can all agree on. And, you know, it, we're not just wasting food, as you said, we're wasting natural resources and inputs and the love and the labor that goes into growing food. And I think what's clear from this conversation is that we need more collaboration. We need more people involved. We need farmers talking to nutritionists and policymakers and, and others to really solve these problems. Vim Lender, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. I, I hesitate to say happy world Food day, but happy World Food Day, and thank you for all you do for the food system. Thank you so much, and it's a pleasure uh, working with you and working with Food Tank, and we look forward to further collaboration because I, I think you rightly said partnership. No one organization, no one individual uh, can claim mastery in everything. So the, we all have our competitive advantages, and we got to leverage that with partnerships. And only when we all come together, I think uh, we can. Uh, take uh, steps forward to uh, solve this problem. Absolutely. Stay safe and well, my friend. Thank you. Thank you so much. And you too. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Recognizing the power of poetry to move hearts and minds, uh, we started, we at FAO North America started a World Food Day Poetry Contest in 2018. We really feel Poetry does what little else can, it inspires, and it, the poetry speaks uh, to the reader intimately and exclusively. It allows you to actually paint a picture in your mind, and that's your own exclusive picture. And understanding this part of poetry, we in partnership with uh, Poetry X Hunger, and also now collaborating with Capital Area Food Bank, started this uh, poetry contest to help take the message forward that if we are in it together, we can actually uh, save the world from hunger and malnutrition. Uh, this is the third year and uh, we have had a competition. Very soon we will hear a poem themed Grow, Nourish, Sustain together from Metheny Eltigani. Uh, Metheny is a recent alum of the Bill Emerson National Hunger Fellowship and is currently pursuing a master's in public health nutrition from New York University. She completed her undergraduate study at the University of Pennsylvania with major in nutrition and sociology. Her passion for increasing access to quality food and eliminating food insecurity comes from personal experience and commitment to equity and justice. It's a, it's a fantastic poem. And what really struck me in this one, I'll just read out two lines uh, something which really struck, uh, and I think which is the real crux and the heart of this poem. And uh, Metheny says, and I quote, I find it hard to believe where there is plenty to spare, that there shall still be those of us whose cabinets are bare. Is that we don't care? Is humanity so rare? I think these lines really speak uh, the truth about where we are today. And really call us to out to us to improve, to reorient, to transform, and ensure that every cabinet has enough food to feed the people in the family. So with that, let me call on Metheny Eltigani to read her poem to us. Metheny. Hi, my name is Metheny Eltigani, and my poem is called Grow, Nourish, Sustain Together. Grow. 
We mention food deserts as if nothing can grow there, like we cannot plant seeds to water and sow there. I find it hard to believe when there's plenty to spare that there are still those of us whose cabinets are bare. Is it that we don't care? Is humanity so rare? What stops us from building gardens everywhere for all to eat and be merry with plenty to share? Nourish. We nourish ourselves with the food on our plate, but for some there's never enough to satiate, to flourish and grow, to live and create. We must be free from hunger and pain. If we all work together, this pain can abate in a world free of hunger that we cultivate. While so many suffer, there's no time to wait. Sustain. Making change is one thing, but we must make it last. That means no one left out, not one outcast. If our actions are our future, we must learn from our past and answer all the questions that were too hard to ask. Where have we failed? How can we surpass? All that I know is we have to act fast to make food insecurity a thing of the past. Together. If divided we fail and united we stand, then we all must learn to lend a hand. It's true that some problems are far too grand to ever be conquered by just one man, but hunger is solvable if we're all on the plan. And just by joining together, our reach will expand and touch every corner of every land. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Laura Riley, and I am the business of food reporter for the Washington Post. And today I have the great honor to interview and speak with Leah Penniman, who is the co-founder of Soul Fire Farm and the author of Farming While Black, a book that came out a couple years ago, but has never seemed more salient and, and relevant to the world we're living in right now. Um, it's been called kind of part, uh, kind of how to part agricultural guide, part uh, revolutionary manifesto. And I am so thrilled to be speaking with her today. And Leah, I'd love to hear you introduce yourself more uh, eloquently than I just did. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's truly an honor. And I mean, you said it, I've been tending the earth and fighting for food justice for over 25 years now. And it truly is a labor of love. You know, we at Soul Fire Farm, we tend 80 acres of traditionally Mohican territory and use our ancestral practices to take care of the land, feed the community and train the next generation of black farmers. So it's so exciting to get to be here today to talk about the future of food and how we can all participate in healing and repairing the food system. So I'd love to start by just having you define some terms, I think that that um, for people who are kind of uninitiated or just unfamiliar with this space, it might be helpful to have you talk a little bit about, I've heard you speak about food apartheid as opposed to a food desert, um, things like anti-oppressive practices or Afro-Indigenous and regenerative practices. I'd love to hear just kind of how, how you're defining some of the terms that you use widely, just so moving forward into this conversation, we have everyone on the same page. Food apartheid is a very important term that was taught to be by my mentor, Karen Washington of Rise and Root Farm, because the way the government talks about a neighborhood that's high poverty and doesn't have any grocery stores is a food desert. And the tragedy in that term is it implies it's a natural phenomenon that certain people, often based on the color of their skin and certainly their zip code, don't have access to fresh, healthy food have very high rates of diabetes, you know, cancer, heart disease, kidney failure, and other diet-related illnesses, while other people get farmers markets and, and fresh, healthy food stores. And there really is nothing natural or accidental about that. It's a human-created system rooted in centuries of oppression um, of black and brown people, housing discrimination, redlining, and so forth. And the good news is when you use a term like food apartheid that defines it as human created, it means that people can also fix it. There's nothing inevitable about it. So that's an important term. Afro-Indigenous is also so sacred to us. You know, as a, a longtime farmer, I had the misunderstanding that all of these sustainable ag practices that we cherish, like raised beds and permaculture, compost and, and mulches and capturing carbon, that these were somehow either ahistorical or European generated, when in fact so many of them come from pre-colonial uh, African communities and, and African communities in the diaspora. So when we talk about Afro-Indigenous, we're talking about reclaiming that legacy of a uh, proud agrarian legacy and really connecting to the ways that our ancestors have been in relationship with the lands, which weren't defined by uh, the colonial norms and rules that they found themselves a part of. Wonderful. I, I think that that's a great, great explanation on all of that. You also talk a little bit about food sovereignty farmers. And, and I think for people who don't know that term, that might be a good one to kind of unpack a little bit. 
Definitely. Well, the term food sovereignty comes out of an international indigenous movement called Via Campesina. And this peasant movement on all arable continents has uh, organized in resistance to the industrial takeover of the food system, you know, corporations like Monsanto trying to push hybrid and GMO seed, the land grabbing um, by colonial entities and so forth. And they define food sovereignty as the right of each person and each community to meaningfully participate in the democracy of the food system. That means land ownership. Uh, it means access to the healthy seeds and the means of production, the rights of farm workers and farmers, the rights of women and non-binary and trans folks uh, to be able to participate in the food system. And then of course, all the way to the plate, you know, looking at who gets to eat, who has access and whether that food is culturally appropriate, affordable, healthy, um, and honors the hands that, that brought it to that table. So it's really a, as you know, as my wonderful teenage daughter Nishima says, the food system is everything it takes to get sunshine onto your plate. So we have food sovereignty when we have justice in that entire arc from sunshine to plate. Wonderful. So I'd love to, as kind of our first big question, really talk about your vision for a redistribution of land, um, equitable redistribution of land. I think, you know, we've seen in the past, just really in the past, um, I don't know, 18 months, reparations have become less of like this pipe dream, ridiculous notion and more of a real kind of political platform or, or a talking point um, that I think has has a growing, uh, you know, understanding among the average American. So can you talk a little bit about kind of how you envision a redistribution of land and what, what that would mean in terms of farmers of color? Yeah, this is such an important topic. I mean, land is really the basis of all wealth and power in this country. And if a community doesn't have access to any, we're out of the picture. And that's loosely quoting Ralph Page of the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. So a little bit of historical context is that I, I hope that most people uh, watching know that this entire continent, almost without exception, was wrested away through genocidal attacks against indigenous people. And, and many of the territories that we grow food on, these are unceded territories that rightfully belong to uh, indigenous people who continue to live and thrive here on this continent and are, are, are battling for the sovereignty of their lands and, and we stand by them. And this original theft of land, which is well baked into uh, our legal precedent through the doctrine of discovery, is, is not the only one. Uh, when black and brown folks have attempted to be land owners throughout the history of this country, there's been many blocks and obstacles. Uh, perhaps most notably, you know, in 1910, when black farmers had managed to acquire almost 16 million acres of land, which was 14 percent of the nation's farms and, and the peak of black land ownership. There was a violent attacks on these landowners for their audacity to stop being sharecroppers or try to have their own businesses. Um, it was around the time, you know, of the burning of Black Wall Street. There was also the burning of black farms and 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 people were lynched. I mean, they were attacked. Their houses were burned. They were driven north. And it's one of the major reasons why, you know, black land ownership went from 14 percent of the nation's farms down to just over one percent today. Uh, and it's more than we can get into. But there's also a whole history of the federal government discriminating against black farmers and their lending practices and, you know, retirement companies buying up black land, uh, taking advantage of when someone didn't leave a will and so forth. So all that to say, you know, when you look at the census today and you look at rural land ownership, farm land ownership, it's between 95 and 98 percent white. That means of all the land that can grow food, almost all of it is in white hands. And, and with such a diverse country, I don't think we can really justify having such a concentration of, of power in the form of land just in the hands of one uh, racial group. We really need to think about redistributing and sharing that land. And there are many strategies. You know, we are a founding member organization of the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust, uh, which actually receives reparations gifts of land, which are then redistributed to indigenous communities and to black farmers. And there are many people who, you know, have inherited land uh, that they would like to pass on or in other ways came into land and see that the right thing to do is to give it back. Um, there also is a national movement around setting us some federal lands and to trust uh, for black farmers and establishing funds to purchase desirable lands off the private market for black farmers. So, so there's a number of strategies. And, um, you know, we're very, very excited that we happen to be in a time where 
reparations is not a four letter word and we can talk seriously about what it looks like to create a fair and just society that acknowledges the pains of history. So, so you've talked quite a bit about how farming is kind of one of the whitest professions, but right now it's also one of the, uh, it, it skews really old, you know, I mean, not to, I'm, I'm not denigrating anyone who's an older farmer, but it, it is, it strikes me that it's a moment where there is an opportunity for a lot of change, you know, and there's a lot of enthusiasm amongst young farmers and young farmers of color. Um, what needs to happen in legislatively and, and otherwise to nurture those young farmers of color? Right. What an exciting time. I mean, certainly I do think that we are part of this returning generation of farmers whose grandparents and great grandparents fled the red clays of Georgia and the oppression, racialized oppression of the South in search of something different and better. And we, their descendants, are realizing that, you know, a piece of our culture and our souls that was left behind in that soil. And, and we need to go back and, and pick that up and carry that forward. So, you know, we run training programs here at Soul Fire Farm, and there are multi-year waiting lists of black and brown folks who want to get their hands in the earth. Um, and we do have some strategies about how to nurture that. But I will say it's very, very important to note that while being a farm manager or landowner is among the whitest professions in the United States, it is still uh, you know, being a farm laborer, farm worker is among the brownest, you know, predominantly Latinx, Hispanic folks are the ones who are pulling the food from the earth. And that's that's 85 percent of farm workers who who are people of color. And and so part of the answer is how do we then support these expert farmers who just happen to be working for wages and not be the managers to move into management ownership. And the answer to that is about training pathways. It's about uh, reforming our immigration laws, reforming the H-2A visa so there's more permanent protections, ensuring the rights of farm workers and fair wages, right? So that that's crucial. I think additionally, when we think about pipeline, you know, there's a lot of barriers to entry. Uh, certainly many black and brown folks, you know, can't afford to go work for free on some internship on a farm as a way of learning or, or, or pay a tuition at a, a faraway land grant college. And so how do we think about creating the equivalent of a, a youth conservation core that supports people and pays people to get into farming? You know, how do we think about setting aside land and capital specifically for black and brown folks who want to get into the profession? Because those startup fees are, are really high. Um, you know, capitalizing a new farm. Um, and how do we make sure that that markets are open to uh, these farmers coming in through aggregation and food hubs? And so, you know, there's a number of strategies and the good news is they already exist. And a lot of them, uh, you know, were originally catalyzed in the black community and just need the resources and support to grow to scale in order to get this returning generation on the land. Wonderful. I think that that was just so well spoken. So, Returning to the idea of guaranteeing the, guaranteeing the rights of farm workers, um, I just did a story for the Post on farm worker uh, vulnerability to COVID, and I was pretty stunned to realize that the CDC is not tracking farm worker outbreaks. OSHA has done very little in terms of tracking farm worker um, outbreaks, and and because of the the uh, transient nature of a lot of the migratory workers and their their immigration status frequently they are falling through the cracks and 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 so i guess what what can we do to assure um that these essential workers have are are able to work in a safe environment and then are compensated adequately what 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 should we be doing better this is such a crucial question and i think that you know it's no accident that farm workers are quote falling through the cracks the system is actually designed that way so you know tracking back in history to the 1930s when we had this first wonderful package of progressive legislation to support the american worker things like the 8 hour workday child labor protections the right to unionize the right to a day off in 7 um social, you know, health insurance, the, all these protections for workers actually categorically excluded uh, farm workers and domestic workers because they were black and brown. And the Southern Democrats would not vote for this New Deal legislation um, if it benefited in any way people that they saw as a lower and less deserving class than them. And you would hope that we would have rectified all this by now. But unfortunately, the Fair Labor Standards Act and the National Labor Relations Act still exclude 
farm workers and domestic workers. So if you're a farm worker, you have a, a different set of labor protections and, and you don't have the right to unionize. You know, you don't have the right to a day off. You, If you work on a farm with less than seven employees, there isn't even a federal minimum wage. And this is, this is an atrocity, right? So we need to pass the uh, Fairness for Farm Workers Act now, yesterday, right? <laughs> 100 years ago. And additionally, the nature of the visa that many of these workers come in on, the, the H-2A visa, is such that they don't have the um, permission or ability to, to move between employers. So they are uh, stuck in a contract with a particular employer, which really discourages any type of reporting of, of wage theft, sexual abuse, or other harms on the job site, which are tragically quite rampant when audit auditors go in because they'll be deported um, if they are released from the contract with that employer. And so switching out that H-2A visa for the North American workers visa, which actually allows workers to uh, you know, move between employers and have more protections um, is another structural solution, you know, in addition to these agencies hopefully going in and asking the right questions in the short term. Wonderful. So I'd like to just shift a teeny bit and talk about uh, regenerative ag and kind of how, I think one thing I've read that you've said a lot is, is, is kind of getting the best advice of your ancestors. So how, how have you as a farmer or as a kind of an amateur historian, how, how have you gotten um, like concrete, um, you know, advice from ancestors that's salient or that, that works for you on your own farm? Well, now you're making me think about defining terms. So maybe I should just say briefly that regenerative ag, in short, is when people actually make the earth better while growing food. It's a simplified way to put it. But, you know, an ancestral example would be from my maternal homelands, you know, in Ghana, West Africa. There is a practice that the women farmers have of making this super rich pyrogenic compost that combines uh, ash from the cooking fires, you know, residues from crops and kitchen scraps, bone char, uh, beneficial microorganisms that have been, uh, you know, gathered from the forest. And they mix this all together. They make this great compost. It fertilizes the crops. But here's the amazing thing. There is an obligation that every person in every community contributes to this compost so much so that if you were to take a soil core, and people have done this in the community, you can read the layers of compost, almost like rings of a tree, to determine the age of the community, because everyone has consistently been adding right to this soil. So that, to me, there's nothing that exemplifies regenerative more than this idea that we as people, our job is not to destroy topsoil, you know, the way European colonizers did when they first came to Turtle Island, this continent, and within a single generation had released half of the organic matter into the air through extensive plowing. Like, that's not our job. Our job is actually to build soil layer upon layer so the evidence of our care for the earth is left behind in the memory of that soil core. Um, so that's one example. but you know, I'm, I'm a nerd. And so I'm always reading up on the history of uh, Afro-Indigenous farming practices. We do our best to implement them here at Soul Fire Farm, build upon them, innovate upon them. And uh, it's been very inspiring to start with a hypothesis that, you know, Black folks certainly have contributed to sustainable farming and then find at every turn, whether I'm investigating compost, orcharding, livestock, to find uh, you know, beautiful concrete examples of this. So I'll give you one more, which is Dr. George Washington Carver of Tuskegee University, late 1800s professor. He was the one of the very first uh, professors or farmers to modernize organic agriculture. I mean, he taught cover cropping, composting. He taught people to graze their animals on chestnuts and acorns as a way of regenerating the forest and creating these integrated systems. And this is two whole generations before Rodale, who many people uh, venerate as the founder of Organic. And it, it's been very powerful for us to reclaim these stories and to help this next generation of Black farmers really be proud of what their ancestors and, and their community have contributed to this body of knowledge. Yay for George Washington Carver. That's awesome. So I, one thing that I've, I've read um, about you, I think it's maybe it's your grandmother that you talked about weaving seeds into her hair. I just thought it was such a lush kind of cinematic visual. Can you talk a teeny bit about that? 
Sure. So we need to go all the way back to my grandma's grandma's grandma, who's Susie okay. Boyd, and she likes so many, <laughs> like so many people in the Dahomey region of West Africa in the 16 and 1700s was witnessing her community members get kidnapped and forced marched to the sea and, you know, shoved on, shoved onto boats. And there was no report back. So nobody knew really what was happening to their relatives and lots of, of terrifying theories arose. Um, but she and, and many other members of her community had this audacious hope and they gathered up their millet, cow pea, black rice, the goosey melon, sesame, all these seeds that they've been saving for generations and braided them into their hair as insurance for an uncertain future. And so in the face of that absolute terror, they believed that there would be a future of tilling and reaping on the soil and that we, their descendants, would exist and need to inherit the seed. And so my prayer is that I and we uh, honor the legacy of that seed that we tuck it into the fertile and waiting grounds and nurture it and, and pass it on to the next generation, not letting it die out. I think that's just such a beautiful image. So I'd like to, to talk a little bit about food insecurity. I mean, so this, as of a week before, a week ago or so, um, a new study came out that said one in 10 Americans are food insecure right now. And obviously uh, that skews much higher if you're talking about black and brown people. Um, and, you know, Feeding America, I did a story yesterday with them. Um, they say that they're anticipating a six to eight billion meal shortfall in the next 12 months. So, I mean, massive um, chickens coming home to roost with the pandemic, uh, massive unemployment. So what, what can we do um, to ensure that uh, food insecurity is not so disproportionately uh, the burden of, of black and brown communities? Mm, such a big question. I mean, yeah, I think I read that study that it's it's one in 10 households are food insecure now in the U.S. and it's one in four for black families um, and slightly higher for indigenous families, uh, which I think we just have to emphasize it's not because black and brown folks don't know how to eat well or don't work hard or somehow are at fault uh, for the hunger. There really is a, a whole history of systemic reasons that result in the fact that your zip code is one of the major determiners of your life expectancy and also correlates with whether there is any fresh food in your neighborhood, whether you own your house, if there's money in the bank or if it's negative, you know, what your income is, how policed you are. Uh, whether your schools have adequate ventilation, you know, all of these things are, are deeply correlated with our, our country's shameful history of uh, ghettoization of black and brown people, housing discrimination, and, and you know, what we, what we term white affirmative action, which is the whole history of policies that benefit white people in terms of wealth and land ownership at the expense of folks of color. So, so there isn't a quick and easy answer to this. I mean, it really is fundamentally about wealth redistribution, um, about home ownership and business ownership, about equal access to education and reparations uh, that ultimately lead to whether there's food on your plate. And in the meantime, right, because the systems change, the systems change does take some time. It's very important that we engage actively with our local grassroots mutual aid networks. And I've been personally very inspired to see farmers in our region collaborating with nonprofit organizations, church groups, Black Lives Matter organizers, and, you know, unaffiliated individuals to make sure that everyone eats, you know, because fundamentally that person to person compassion and solidarity is what uh, is the building block of the type of society we want to see. So I would say get involved with your mutual aid network, make a personal commitment that nobody's going hungry on your watch and figure out how to make sure that, you know, we have enough urban gardens and farmers markets and supermarkets and home delivery of food and, um, and pitch in. And I think that hopefully that will trickle up and inspire some of the deeper systems change that will make it a permanent atrocity for anyone to go hungry in this country. Gosh, I hope you're right. Uh, you know, so I, I do think that, that um, you know, it, it's all of this is heightened in, in the pandemic because all of these lifestyle related diseases are comorbidity factors that, that make people more vulnerable to COVID. You've definitely said that, that kind of, that you don't think education is the key, as you just said, that it's, you know, it's not that people don't know how to cook. Um, 
what what are other factors that that should be addressed or could be systemically addressed that allow people i mean you said obviously access to to fresh food but but some of it is time is kind of having having kind of ownership or kind of sovereignty over your own time are there other things that can, can be done to ensure that people have a little more space to um to cook for their families to cook for each other to maybe grow something i mean are there are there things that we could do easily <laughs> to nip at the margins here <laughs> Oh, easy, right? I, I guess I didn't come to talk about easy solutions, so I apologize for that. You know, and I and I really want to underscore what you what you say. There actually isn't evidence that, you know, handing people recipe cards or preaching to folks about kale salad is what makes the difference because it's about access. You know, if you only have three dollars in your pocket and there's only a bodega or a corner store or liquor store in your neighborhood, you're gonna get hot Cheetos and blue flavored drink. You're not gonna be able to make an arugula salad with glazed pecans. It's just not accessible, um, not to mention not culturally appropriate. I would say that, you know, some of the the efforts that have been successful that are really appreciated um, as far as, you know, sharing knowledge about, about the ways that we can prepare foods are the ones that are, are based on community chefs. And so there's a, a wonderful organization that puts out these heritage food ways, including the African Heritage Food Pyramid, which is very different than the USDA recommended food guidelines. And it's based on tubers, greens, uh, spicy food, uh, fish, and so forth. And I've, I've seen some success and it had some personal success with hiring, you know, Black elders from the church to teach their favorite home recipes, you know, to the community and to make sure that everybody has their cutting board and their knife and, um, the fresh food deliveries that they need to then implement those, those same recipes. So those resources are made available as well. And, uh, you know, when our young, young folks come out to the farm and have the opportunity to grow the food themselves, prepare the food themselves, you know, everybody eats that vegetarian burrito, you know, everyone eats that sancocho soup uh, without exception because the quality of the food and the opportunity to really participate in the food from, from soil to plate, uh, is enlivening and meaningful and dignifying. And so thinking about how do we make our relationship to food, you know, infused with this dignity and this meaning and connection and sovereignty is going to be part of the solution as well. Wonderful. So I think our time is getting a little bit uh, scant. Um, so I think I've heard you talk about how white supremacy and systemic racism need to be addressed in order to heal our food system. But it really, listening to you today, it seems like you almost feel the inverse is also true that 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 fixing the food system may um, ameliorate some of these longstanding systemic problems in terms of how we relate to each other. Is that, am I overstepping to say that, or is that something that that, that fits into how you think about the world? I mean, I think you're really onto something. And one of the things that so excites me about the movement for Black Lives and a lot of the other um, current day social justice movements is that we don't see these issues as separate. So racial capitalism underpins the food system, the housing system, education, healthcare, policing, incarceration, uh, the way we treat the earth. And so it's impossible to isolate one issue or another and solve it and imagine that then we're going to have a just and sustainable and, and beautiful society where each person's dignity is honored. And my prayer and my, my hope is that we can respect the lanes that we each work in. You know, so the folks who are very committed to prison abolition can look over and see us working on food and land sovereignty give us a nod and a smile and thumbs up and we can do the same for them, understanding that each of us are tugging at different strings that will ultimately unravel this, this whole beast um, that wants to exploit human beings on the earth. Leah, this has been such an honor and a joy to, to have this conversation, this conversation with you today. And um, I am thrilled to see what you do next. And I would love to have the opportunity to come to your farm and have that soup you were talking about for sure. Um, but if there are, are there any other last thoughts you'd like to leave the, the listeners with today? 
Well, it's been an absolute pleasure. So thank you for asking those provocative and important questions. And I would leave our viewers with the message that the earth loves you back and she's been yearning uh, for you to return. So I welcome everyone in big or small ways to enter once again into that covenant that we have with the land. I'm so excited to introduce chef and fierce food advocate, Jose Andres. He is not only an amazing chef, but a true American hero, as well as a 2019 recipient of the Julia Child Award. I'm also proud to call him a friend. His organization, World Central Kitchen, has unfortunately been busier than ever this year, not only helping feed thousands and thousands of people because of the pandemic, but helping those in need in Lebanon after the massive explosion, in Louisiana after Hurricane Laura, in California during the ongoing wildfires, and probably a million other places that I've missed. The world has seen so much calamity in 2020, but when people need help, World Central Kitchen and Jose Andres are there. He's a force of nature and a fierce advocate for social, environmental, economic, and food system justice. And he's become very vocal about the need for having legislation from the federal government to help restaurants. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jose. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. And congratulations to you on this amazing uh, Julia Child Award. Uh, you deserve it uh, for your amazing work, bringing all of us uh, knowledge uh, every single day and to understand how we fit America and how we should fit America. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. So I, I want to start off talking about that point I just mentioned. Why do lawmakers tend to undervalue the contribution of restaurants and the people who work at them and, and provide all of us with amazing dishes? Why, why are restaurants being sort of missed during this pandemic? Well, I, I only think that, unfortunately, because being in politics require for you to be on campaign, or for you to be on the Hill, uh, negotiating uh, the next bills. And uh, I think we are creating a moment where our leaders don't spend probably enough time with boots on the ground. When you don't right. spend enough time with boots on the ground, you kind of go burn from a bubble, a bubble mm -hmm. that uh, I know many congressmen, many senators uh, on the Republican Party, on the Democratic Party, they care. But it's true that sometimes it feels like they are not there in their communities. And I know if some of them are listening uh, to me right now, they will say, come on, Jose, you know, you know I am on the community. Uh, but not really, because uh, if they will see really the hunger lines we've seen in places like Queens and the issues that we're facing in Navajo Nation, in uh, Oklahoma, in, in Arizona, in New Mexico, uh, the issues we are seeing in places like Oakland and Los Angeles, uh, right here in D.C., uh, is no, no, no reason of why. They've been waiting already, no weeks, but months of coming right. to a, with a comp uh, comprehensive package uh, to make sure that through this pandemic, food not will be an issue. So therefore, here we are waiting seven, eight months later for a package that will help uh, governors, but more, uh, more important, mayors. We need to remember that the mayors are the ones that they are on the trenches of this pandemic, and they know what's happened, what's happening in their communities. So it's a big disconnect right. between uh, the people that lead and the real needs on the ground. We need to be bringing uh, our leaders closer to where things are happening, so they can lead in real time with real decisions that will have real impacts. Food is simple to understand. Or people are fed or people are not fed. It's no reason when we learn that they are not being fed to don't take action immediately. Absolutely. And I love that you mentioned mayors because, you, you, like you said, they are on the front lines of this. They realize how important restaurants are to their communities, to creating jobs, to attracting residents. And I, I think that local connection, we can't only be looking at the federal government, although they need to step up, but we need to be in support of those mayors who are trying to do the right thing. And 
and, you know, town councils and, and school boards and all those local institutions that really can really make a difference? Um, in our case, um, Wall Central Kitchen, I think we did we did few things from the beginning that uh, I'm very proud of. Uh, uh, and there were things that they were very practical. I remember that uh, we began feeding people, obviously, in February when we went to Japan. A uh, team of Wall Central Kitchen began feeding uh, many, many Americans at the Princess cruise ship uh, in Yokohama. Mm -hmm in a port near Tokyo. And it's the moment we realized this was going to be a big problem. Uh, once we, we, we were already 100% concentrated in this pandemic is hitting America, it's gonna hit the world as bad as it is in, in mid uh, February, we put all our thinking in how we're gonna be doing this. When I realized that my own restaurants, uh, I had to close them. Well, because I felt, uh, that we didn't know enough about this virus and I had to protect my teams. And in some instances, it's because it was mandatory. So I think we all did the right thing closing, but we, sure. we, 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 we had to understand that closing restaurants was going to be having a huge ripple effect. What was going to be happening with all the people working on them? Uh, imagine millions and millions of people that uh, work, their lives depend on restaurants directly and indirectly down all the chain, all the way to the production of food. Uh, this was going to be a uh, mayor. But for me, it was very, very clear when uh, on March 14th, 15th, I kind of announced that we were going to go from being a restaurant to being a community kitchen. When I did that very sure. simple move with my restaurants in DC was to send a message and the restaurant in New York was to say, uh, this is going to be bad uh, because the system is shutting down because everybody is going to be at home. Uh, it's going to be a lot of services that still we're going to have to be providing. And I, and I foresee problems like on the hospitals that some people will not be able to go to work. And so some of the restaurant uh, food facilities inside hospitals were going to be shut down. We were right. right. I was right. So we were covering those. Some NGOs had to close for lack of funding or because also they were looking for the safety of their people. They are not directly on emergency like World Central Kitchen is. So me, I began thinking, I'm not gonna be convincing others not to close because probably they're doing the right thing, but I'm gonna create a system of safety. So we created Maskey, which is this mascot that tells us how to be safe producing food and right. delivering the food, keeping everybody healthy. That's when we were able to have restaurants uh, open as community kitchens all across America, almost 3,000 restaurants. And where the money we were raising, uh, we used those restaurants on the front lines to be able to feed people in need at the local level from elderly homes, first responders, uh, uh, nurses and doctors, all of the above, homeless, and in the process, being able to pay them so they could pay their employees, they could pay rent, they could pay their farmers and their food purveyors, and nobody got rich doing this. Right. The people that the restaurants they did this was because they have a, so much empathy and so much care for the community. And actually, we could be taking more restaurants. What happened is we didn't have more funds. Uh, everybody wanted to be part of this, uh, uh, but sure. we 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 kind of show that the solution was simple. We didn't need to reinvent the wheel, so we kind of push for a bill that was already an ex uh, with a real example of what if the federal government, through its emergency arm, which is FEMA, will approve that hundred percent of uh, the relief uh, money will go mm -hmm. to help mayors hire restaurants that then in partnership with NGOs like us that we have a lot of experience in creating systems of distribution, we respond to this pandemic in an effective way. This was one, one system we passed the bill on the con on Congress, we got bipartisan support. We passed the bill, uh, we, we got support on the Senate with people like Senator Tim Scott, of South Carolina and Senator Kamala Harris of California, again, bipartisan, many more senators came in. And we show that sometimes if we can prove uh, uh, 
that something works, then that idea can become one day a bill. But already we've shown that the idea works and that now we need the full support of the federal government. This was one of the many things the federal government is going to have to do to help restaurants and the food industry go through this pandemic in the process of feeding America. Absolutely. And it is such a win-win what you've created. It, it helps communities. It feeds people. It keeps restaurants in business. Uh, it, it supports local economies. But I think what bothers me and what has continued to bother me throughout this pandemic is that the federal government hasn't, you know, as we've said, has not stepped up to the plate. Philanthropy can't do everything, as you know, Jose. And so I, I'm wondering, you know, you're getting that bipartisan support, but it hasn't been enough. How do we convince those leaders to really take action now? Well, it's very simple. Uh, it's election. Uh, it's been election. It's election year. Uh, every moment counts. And obviously, um, I am. Uh, I have to say that. Overall, I, I think the federal government has been very ill-prepared to respond to the many issues, and this goes beyond how to respond to COVID itself. I think uh, we've seen that the increase of, of, of hunger in America has, has, has increased dramatically with so many people still out of jobs, uh, many people not being able to receive unemployment and, and other bunch uh, of reasons. Uh, we've seen failing policies where on this uh, economic war between America and China, um, at the end, what we've seen is that the federal government has to be putting billions of dollars to pay uh, the farmers of America, even not to grow food anymore. So, so because of failure in the economic policies with China, in a moment of hunger, in a moment that we should be productive and feed everybody, we've seen the federal government pay farmers almost not to produce. And when I say that, probably are the very big farmers. On the other hand, we've seen that we had a lot of small farmers on the other edge that they had restaurants like mine to put an output. Even I know many farmers, they've done well on farmers markets. It means many other farmers that the traditional way of living has been cut because traditionally that restaurants will be output of their production. We've been, go we've been gone. So imagine if we had the federal government coming through the USDA to put that, that bill and to buy food directly from farmers that then we can redirect through food banks or NGOs like us or soup kitchens or school lunch systems and all of a sudden make sure that no money is wasted that the money goes to pay farmers and so they can keep producing and get ready for the next season. And in the process, feed the people that are hungry and created a great 360 degree economic system where food is not a problem anymore, right. but part of the solution and where every federal dollar is multiplied by four. Uh, it's NAPs. Why we didn't increase NAPs? Uh, and why we didn't uh, increase not the amount, but also the possibilities. So NAPs could be right. used in local restaurants to feed families, where the federal dollars come to feed families, and in the process, we are able to keep restaurants open. And again, we are able to invest the money of the federal government two, three times over, and that's smart. Or why we don't increase the school lunch uh, programs where they don't only will feed the children, but if we know those children come from families that they are under the poverty level, that the children will not be the only recipient of those meals, but their entire household, their entire family unit. Why? Because we needed to have multiple ways of providing that food, especially in, in poor areas of America, in poor rural areas of America. Why, why we, we didn't put more dollars to the uh, food banks, which, by the way, and the food banks they're going to have between all of the us over the next six months, nine months, we're going to have to be putting not millions, but billions of daily meals out there. So just, we are ready. The food people of America are ready. We have the systems. Absolutely. Great advice. Food is the solution. I nominate you for Secretary of Food, Chef Jose Andres. Thank you so much for joining us today. You are an American hero. Thank you again. Mm -hmm. Thank you.